progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we open the word of the Lord and his prophet, shall we seek his guidance so that these words may have import for us today so that we may understand them in the view of the work that we are going to need to do in the near future. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the examples that you are presenting before us, for the guidance that you are giving us, for the time that you are allowing us to center our minds upon your word. Be with us now. Guide us and direct us so that we may understand and we may apply these things to our lives and be able to apply these things to the work that will be before us. May our ears be open. May our minds be clear. May our necks not be stiff. May we learn to walk before you softly, patiently, and in the way that you would have us to walk. Help us now, Father, in all these things. For this, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we prepare to open the book of Zephaniah. There are some points that we need to consider yet again that Mrs. White had presented in Testimony 27, which you will find also in the fourth Testimony Omnibus Edition. There were two other false prophets, Ahab and Zedekiah. The first false prophet was Hananiah. But there are two others, Ahab and Zedekiah, who prophesied lies in the name of the Lord. These men professed to be holy teachers, but their lives were corrupt, and they were slaves to the to pleasures of sin. The prophet of God had condemned the evil course of these men and warned them of their danger. But instead of repenting and reforming, they were angry with the faithful reproof of their sins and sought to thwart his work by stirring up the people to disbelieve his words and act contrary to the counsel of God in the matter of subjecting themselves to the king of Babylon. The Lord testified through Jeremiah that these false prophets should be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon and slain before his eyes, all of which prediction was fulfilled in good time. Here again, these were men that, sm that spoke smooth things, that gave a peace and safety message, much as we are seeing given today. We cannot afford to give a peace and safety message. It is either the straight testimony of the Lord or it is a lie. Other false prophets arose to sow confusion among the people <clears throat> by turning them away from obeying the divine commands given through Jeremiah. But God's judgments were pronounced against them in consequence of their grievous sin of bringing rebellion against him. Uh, just uh, 
a comment here. Please. So um, in, in the context here, talking about these false prophets, this is Jeremiah chapter 29. And, um, and this is in Jeremiah's letter to the exiles. So, right. so he's giving a message because, well, he's a true prophet, but, but there's all of these false prophets giving false messages that go contrary to the message that God gave him. And um, so Ellen White's going through this and naming off these different prophets and just describing this this situation. So there's there are these different voices vying for attention. And and the one group's basically giving a, a peace and safety message. And the other group is saying that we need to submit uh, to God's judgments against this nation because of its sins. Right? That's exactly that's okay. Before July 18th, there were others that chose to recognize that Mrs. White had prophesied of the destruction of Nashville. But they did not believe that this should be widely publicized. Two of these have operated within the Upper Columbia Conference. One of these has had a, a fairly na national footprint. <clears throat> Both have presented a peace and safety message. There's nothing to worry about. Salvation is within the corporate church. You should not leave the corporate church because this is where your salvation is assured. We cannot afford a message like that in the light of Ezekiel 8 and 9. <clears throat> we cannot afford to find out later of the problems and the issues that have existed if we are unwilling to study for ourselves. Just such men rise in these days and breed confusion and rebellion among the people who profess to obey the law of God. A better description has yet to be given. But just as certainly as divine judgment was visited upon the false prophets, just so surely will these evil workers receive their full measure of retribution, for the Lord has not changed. Those who prophesy lies encourage men to look upon sin as a small matter. When the terrible results of their crimes are made manifest, they seek, if possible, to make the one who has faithfully warned them responsible for their difficulties even as the Jews charge Jeremiah with their evil fortunes. These men chose to live a life of sin, of secret sin. They did not wish their sins to be exposed. They believed they had the right to live the life they so chose. They did not wish to accept the warnings that Jeremiah gave. Those who pursue a course of rebellion against the Lord can always find false prophets who will justify them in their acts and flatter them to their destruction. Lying words often make many friends. As in the case of Ahab and Zedekiah, these false prophets in their pretend zeal for God found many more believers and followers 
than the true prophet who delivered the simple message of the Lord. How often can we point to this in the ministry of Elder Jeff? How many times can we see that there was a falling away when Elder Jeff was pointing out directly and correctly the sins of those that were around him? God commanded Jeremiah to gather the Rechabites into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and set wine before them, and invite them to drink. Jeremiah did as the Lord commanded him. But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord. The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. For unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Here God contrasts the obedience of the Rechabites with the disobedience and the rebellion of his people who will not receive his words of reproof and warning. The Rechabites obeyed the commandment of their father and refused to be enticed into transgression of his requirements. But Israel refuses to hearken unto me, saith the Lord, notwithstanding I have spoken unto you rising early and speaking, but ye hearkened not unto me. Is this going to be what is said of us? Is this going to be what is said about those that speak smooth words? For today is the day of your salvation. Today is the choice that you must make. Do we listen to the word of warning? Or do we listen to the peace and safety message? It's your choice. Now, Open before you is the second chapter of the book of Zephaniah. The first section is an exhortation to repentance. Very much as Jeremiah gave an exhortation to repentance. Much as Ezra gave an exhortation to repentance. Jeremiah faced many false prophets. Ezra. In Ezra 9 and Ezra 10, faced a time where the men of the nation of Israel had chosen not to walk in God's paths. They came to a point where they were given a choice. 
these choices are before us. We have an exhortation to repentance. We have the judgment on the Philistines of Moab and Ammon, of Ethiopia and of Assyria. We're going to do a bit of an overview. And we are going to then get deeply into the verses of this chapter. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation, not desirous. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Is Zephaniah not saying, beware, judgment is coming? Is he not giving us a repeated message? Very much like that we find in Revelation 14. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will ever destroy thee, that there shall be no inha inhabitant. And the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds, and folds for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed upon, in the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening. <clears throat> when the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. <clears throat> I have heard the report, reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. As we have been studying over these last several weeks, the children of Israel chose not to drive out the other nations from their borders. Their idols became a snare. Now, many had to learn and again do that which the Lord would have them to do. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will make lean all the gods of the earth. He will famish all the gods of the earth. And men shall worship him and every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her 
and all the beasts of the nations, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds. For he shall uncover the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in every one that passes by her, shall hiss and wag his hand? We will go through this in detail. But I would suggest that we will see that Zephaniah 2.15 is a reference again unto Rome. Now, there's a comment from the chat. And the comment was that this is corroborated by Ezekiel 25. How so? How would we see this? Well, if you turn to Ezekiel 25, it mentions the prophecy against the Ammonites, the Moabites, Edomites, Philistines. Okay. What is the word of warning that is being given to us right now in Zephaniah 2, verse 1? Prepare for the Sunday law. Prepare for God's judgments. Get into unity. Gather yourselves together. Is this not the message that is being given today to this movement? Does this not have relevance for us today? Yeah, and it it's um, so here uh, in this Zephaniah two. There is um, in in the King James. Yes. So it says, "Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation, not desired." And this is just this this Hebrew word, kashash. Um, uh, it's it, it's it's an interesting word, but uh, it means to become sapless through drought used as in a, as denominative form uh, to for, forage for straw stubble or wood but figuratively it means to assemble or gather together um and if you think of stubble or wood get being gathered together that would sort of be for destruction um it, it would be the normal sort of sense but there's something else um going on here so uh, i mean it's a doubling of this word which is then a symbol of the midnight cry okay is uh, it also not giving reference to the second angel's message yeah yeah which is the midnight cry so that that message the second angel's message and then um uh, why am i having trouble here Okay. So, but when it, you gather oneself together, so the idea is, um, what this reminds me of is when Manasseh is taken captive by Esar Hayden. And um, he, uh, Esar Hayden in his, it's in Prism B, 
and and that he gathers these kings uh, the word there uh, means to muster and basically it, it it's the same definition as this word it's it's a different word but um it's it's collecting or gathering you often building materials sometimes armies sometimes slaves um and so he had mustered or brought all of these different kings from uh, Palestine and the sea coasts uh, and brought them to Babylon, right? So that's why uh, Manasseh was taken captive. He was part of a collection of 22 uh, kings from these different places in Palestine and the sea coasts being brought to Babylon. Um, so this idea of being gathered together or must, must be mustered. So this is for a purpose. They're being brought together for a purpose. And, and then it says, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass, as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So this must be uh, to save them, not necessarily to destroy them, that he wants them to be gathered together. You know, it's a long explanation, but. So he's not talking about the lifeless branches in John 15 that are gathered for burning. Right. That's Where what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yeah, I turned to uh, Psalm 104.16, and it says, The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he has planted. Yeah. Yeah, and of course we see this by verse 3, because it says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. What else do we see when a, when a command is given to gather yourselves? What can we say about an individual to gather themselves. Are they not gathering about them their robe, their cloak, their character? Amen. So the personal message is for us to have our characters right with the Lord. Just as the disciples met in the upper room prior to the Feast of Weeks, prior to what we call Pentecost, Their characters were on clear display with their brothers and sisters. They were within that room for a period of time to seek the Lord, to address any grievance that could be between them and their brothers and sisters and to reveal their characters. Is this not the work that has been going on recently within this movement? We must consider this as we continue through this chapter. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. All of these doublings are pointing toward the midnight cry. Are we not being told that our characters must be ready before the midnight cry? 
so that it can be given loudly and clearly? Now, the references that were used in these passages are fairly clear. When we were first looking at this, we are given a reference back to Joel, chapter 2, 16. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. The word of Joel the prophet is very much like that of Ezra the scribe. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. How much more so today than at the time that these words were written? Job 21.18. They are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. It is a fearsome thing to be described as being stubble. And it's just as bad to be the chaff. Because it means that there is no grain of you. You are nothing but straw. You are nothing but what is left in the ground. What is there for destruction. Psalm 1-4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. What drives away the chaff? What drives away this straw? The wind. Prophetically, what is the wind? What would we say? God's wrath in this Did not the Holy Spirit come upon those at the day of Pentecost like a rushing wind? Our situation here, we do not need to be like chaff. We are given a warning. We are being told that the wind is going to driveth the chaff away. Isaiah 17, 13. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Hosea, before they shall be as the morning cloud, and as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. This last week, there were whirlwinds that touched down in the area where I live. And that's a very uncommon occurrence. There were many trees that went down. There was even a semi-trailer that was moved three feet. But this trailer was not flipped. It was not damaged. It was just moved. Many in this area did not know what to do in the event of a whirlwind touching down. 
How many of us are like this right now? How many of us are not wanting the warning that this is about to happen, that we would rather set this aside and listen to those that say, everything is fine. Everything is going to go on. God is not going to do harm. We have an issue here today. We need to address that which God is putting before us as a warning so that our characters may become as his and may be seen as being right before him. Second Kings 23, 26. Notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. Okay. A quote, a quote in the chat. Manasseh, the apostate, and corrupting misleaders in the mainstream church who have forgotten or abandoned the foundations and helped to make the congregation fall into line with the plots of the papacy. They are captives of Babylon's idolatry and ideology. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. How are we to seek the Lord? Who is to seek the Lord? Does it say here that the proud are to seek the Lord? Does it say that the mighty are to seek the Lord? Does it say that the great are to seek the Lord? All ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. How are we to approach this? Psalm 105, verse 4, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Amos 5, verse 6, seek the Lord and ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. The symbol that is given. We do not need to see the fire breaking out in the house of Joseph. We do not need to see the house of Joseph to be destroyed. And we do not need to see this fire where there is none to quench it in the house of the Lord, in Bethel. And Bethel, of course, was within Judah. When the Lord arose, when God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, Psalm 76, verse 9. Yet again, they return to the book of Joel. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. 
Amos 5.15. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Jonah 3 verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger? that we perish not. For Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday and Ekron shall be rooted up. What do these four cities have in common? From the chat, these are the cities of the Philistines. Are we of God or are we of the Philistines? Gaza shall be forsaken. Ashkelon, a desolation. If we are not of God, we will be destroyed. Jeremiah 47, 4 and 5. Because of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines, and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon every helper that remaineth. For the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaphthor. Baldness is come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long wilt thou cut thyself? Ezekiel 25, 15. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dwelt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. Amos 1, 6 to 8. Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, <clears throat> because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn mine hand upon Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, saith the Lord God. The remnant of the Philistines. Is that being compared with the remnant of God? Zechariah 9, verses 5 and 6. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation, shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod. And I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. What can we say about the bastard that will dwell in Ashkelon? What is being given reference here? Because this bastard shall live in Ashkelon after 
they are driven out from Ashdod at noonday. They're driven out in the heat. They're driven out at the, the warmest part of the day. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. Who is the Lord destroying here? The idolatrous nation. Those that choose not to follow God. Question is being asked. Did the Philistines have Egyptian and Greek bloodlines? We know that they were all related through Noah. We know that they were related not likely through Shem, but possibly through Japheth or Ham. But what they have in common is that they had turned their backs upon God. They wanted to say, we can worship God in our own way. We don't need the law. We don't need the covenant. We don't need to understand these things because, well, they're of the past. All we need is grace. Grace, grace, grace. Where is grace to be found? How is grace to be permitted? What did the Lord say to the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt before they came into the promised land? Keep my covenant. Keep my law. And I will turn from my anger. Jeremiah 6, 4. Prepare ye war against her. Arise and let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. And Jeremiah 15, 8. Their windows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. Their widows are increased to me above the sand of the sea. I have brought upon them against the mother of of the young man, a spoiler at noonday. I have caused him to fall upon it suddenly and terrors upon the city. Ezekiel 25, 16. Therefore saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out mine hand upon the Philistines and I will cut off the Carathams and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. Joshua 13, 3. From Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron, northward, which is counted to the Canaanites, five lords of the Philistines, and the Gazathites, and the Ashdodthites, the Eshkelonthites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, and the Aviites. 
All of these were cities of Canaan. All of these became cities of the Philistine. These were the areas that the children of Israel were to take as their possession. But they would not hearken to the word of the Lord. They would not believe that he could do what he said he would do. Yes, the others had iron chariots. Yes, they were skillful in metalworking and had beautiful swords. But had God not promised that they should go against these people and that he would deliver them? Why did they not choose to listen? Why did they not choose to accept this in their heart? Why today have we not chosen to let God lead? Why have we not fully held onto the word of the Lord? And the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. What? kind of a promise is this for us today? What are you seeing? What do you think? This is the restoration of the faithful of Judah. Okay. Anyone else? What else are you seeing? Is Judah representing the movement? Or is Judah representing the church? I think it's both. How so? Well, as Theodore keeps saying, we have the same false as the mainstream, so we have to judge ourselves with the same measure with which we judge them but if we are going to be repentant and that's a day-by-day -day thing then we will be restored if not we're going to face that we'll probably face worse judgment because we have more truth than the mainline churches when we compare other verses on the remnant of the house of Jews. We come to Isaiah 11.11. 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. He shall set his hand again the second time. He will repeat the messages of the first and the second angel a second time, so that the message of the third angel may go out through the world. That the true hearted believers may come from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, 
which is Babylon. From Hamath and from the islands of the sea. You cannot have a first or second message unless it be established. And when they are established, then the third, which must follow the first and the second, can go forth. Micah 4 7. And I will make her that halted a remnant. And her that was cast far off, a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. Micah 5, 7 and 8. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the son of man. What is this people being as a dew and as the showers upon the grass? Are they not those that have come to understand the doctrine, that have come to understand the message? How else are we seeing this? And the remnant of Jacob shall be upon the Gentile, among the Gentiles, in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Haggai 112. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord, their God, had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Haggai 2.2. 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shetel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, and then we see Zephaniah 2, verse 9, given as a reference before we have come to this verse. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits, and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall Were not Moab and Ammon great nations at this time? Here were the children of Lot. The children of Lot through his daughters. The Moabites and the Ammonites. A perpetual snare to the children of Israel. Now, as we go through this, many times we are seeing examples. Examples of that which we are to avoid, examples of that which we should shun, but yet we are finding many times that these other examples have been accepted within our lives, within the movement, 
within the church. We are no better than the children of Israel. We need to give up our idols. All of this is warnings given to the, the remnant of the house of Judah. That little portion that remains. From Exodus 4.31. And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and they worshiped. Why must we be given so many examples, so many entreaties to turn from our wicked ways? Luke 1, 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Psalm 126. Psalm of the seven times. A song of degrees. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. How much can we say? How much can we glean? From this one psalm, in reference to that which is necessary for this movement. Jeremiah 29, 14. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Was this not indeed written to the captives? Was this not indeed the message that the Lord gave through Jeremiah that the false teachers, the false prophets, wanted to have set aside? Zephaniah 3, verse 20. And at that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among the, all the people of the earth. When I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Is this not a promise to us today, more than it was given? in the time in which it was given to the children of Israel then. How can we apply this for this time? I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. These two verses are pregnant with many meanings for us today.
These are warnings that we need to take to heart. There is much here to be addressed. Returning to, tw to Testimony 27. Here God contrasts the obedience of the Rechabites with the disobedience and rebellion of his people who will not receive the words of reproof and warning. This is not just for the church. It is also for, with, for those within the movement. The Rechabites obeyed the commandment of their father and refused to be enticed into transgression of his requirements. But Israel refuses to hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearkened not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil ways, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them. But this people hath not hearkened unto me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. And I have called unto them, but they have not answered. How are we to react when God speaks and God calls? Say so like Samuel did, Lord, hear my. Okay. Speak. What did Samuel do more than anything else there? Did, um, he, did he not listen? Yeah, he didn't roll over in his sleep and say, oh, it's nothing. Eli recognized that the voice of God was coming to Samuel and not to him. Why was that such a shock for Eli? He wasn't paying attention. He was also the high priest, was he not? Yeah, he's the high priest, but he also had two sons that were running amok, and he did nothing to correct them. Was he not the leader of the church? Yes, he was. As the leader of the church, was it not incumbent upon him to rule his family so that the nation would see that the priest was as God, that these things were important, that, the, that to follow God's law, his covenant, and his teaching started from the top all the way through the nation? Yes. So if we do not choose to follow God's law 
as it is presented to us, are we then forming a character after his? No, we're not. If we're not doing what we've learned. We need to listen. So that it is not <coughs> said about us. Because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. And I have called unto them, but they have not answered. When God speaks, we need to be ready. When he calls, we need to answer. Samuel heard the voice of God, and he answered. What did Isaiah say? Was he not the prophet upon whose lips were touched with the coal from off the altar? Mm. Was his speech then not sanctified? Yes. Okay. Was God unable to direct him against those that would have stood against him? Did God not sustain Isaiah as he did Jeremiah, as he did Jonah, as he did Elijah, when they were confronted with those that would seek their destruction? Yeah. Okay. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandments of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. The Rechabites were commanded, were commended for their ready and willing obedience, while God's people refused to be reproved by their prophets. Because I have spoken unto them, and they have not heard, but I have called unto them, and they have not answered. For this God pronounced judgment upon them. Jeremiah repeated the words of commendation from the Lord to the faithful Rechabites and pronounced blessings upon them in his name. Thus God taught his people that faithfulness and obedience of his requirements would be reflected back upon them in blessings. As the Rechabites were blessed for their obedience to their father's command. We need to consider this today, brothers and sisters. We need to consider if we are obeying and trusting if we live up to the light that is given us we trust in what god is saying to us then more light can be given if we turn away from the light If we seek our own way, the 
then even that which we have been given will be taken from us. If the directions of a good and wise father who took the best and the most effectual means to secure his posterity against the evil of intemperance were to be so strictly obeyed, in as much greater reverence should God's authority be held as he is holier than man. He is our creator and commander, infinite in power and terrible in judgment. In mercy, he employs a variety of means to bring men to see and repent of their sins if they will continue to disregard the reproofs he sends them and act contrary to his declared will, ruin might follow. Right? The word says, ruin must follow. For God's people are kept in prosperity only by his mercy. Through the care of his heavenly messengers, he will not uphold and guard a people who disregard his counsel and despise his reproofs. I've had a lot that I've had to learn over the last few years. When you read a sentence like this, he will not uphold and guard a people who disregard his counsel and despise his reproofs. Does this mean that we can pick and choose what portions of the health message we will follow? Does this mean that we can choose to say, ladies, your salvation is found in wearing slacks? Does this mean that we can say, all food is good to eat? We can be strengthened by our use of the dairy products, especially of that of cheese. I didn't like cheese as a child. As I became older, I loved to eat pizza. I enjoyed cheese. Yet, what counsel does Ellen White give us? Are you familiar with the counsel? He said cheese isn't fit. The cheese is not fit for our table, right? Words to that effect. Yet, within the corporate church, how many times do we attend and we find a fellowship meal? which is much appreciated. But how many times at these fellowship meals do we observe a huge bowl of cheese being placed before the people? He will not uphold and guard a people who disregard counsel and despise his reproofs. Over these last weeks, there have been subjects that have been being addressed very bluntly and very directly. It is a shame to see that within the Adventist health system, that there are many, many egregious 
ignoring of the words of the prophet that occur. From the use of medications that tear down the body, supposed medications that are no more than pharmacaea, to the use of procedures that are not according to God's will. He will not uphold and guard a people who disregard his counsel and despise his reproofs. What else can we say for ourselves within the movement? Are we not told that we are best to rest and to get sleep that the body needs? Are we not told that we should have fresh air, much fresh air, especially when we are ill? Yet, how often do we choose the word of man over the word of God? There are many that I have known that choose to believe in their training, in their degrees, in the accolades of other men rather than accepting the simple word of God. All of this is a warning to us as individuals and to us as a movement. Much as the words of Zephaniah, much as the words of Micah, the warnings of Jeremiah, when we look at all of these, they are all interrelated with what has been given in the book of Daniel and presented to us by Mrs. White. It's our choice as to where our trust is going to lie. Are we going to worship and believe the word of the Lord, or are we going to hold the others up as an idol? Jeremiah was already deprived of his liberty because he would not obey God and give to the king and others occupying responsible positions in Israel the words of warning which he had received from the mouth of God. The Israelites would not accept these reproofs nor allow their course to be questioned. They had manifested great anger and contempt at the words of rebuke and the judgments which were predicted to come upon them if they continued in rebellion against the Lord. Although Israel would not hear the words of divine counsel, it did not make that word of less effect. Neither did God cease to reprove and threaten with his displeasure and his judgments those who refused to re obey his requirements. Jeremiah had a hard path. He spoke to a stiff-necked people that stopped their ears. How much like Elder Jeff for the last several years was Jeremiah? How much like Jeremiah, 
was Elder Jeff treated by those both in and out of the movement? I would say almost exactly like Jeremiah. I've had to examine myself. Was I guilty of treating Elder Jeff in this same way as Jeremiah had been treated? When we look to come to unity, we need to consider how we have treated others around us and those others within the movement. We are supposed to be showing that God's character reigns in us. Yet there are many times that we are showing something that is diametrically opposed to God's character. We need to make the decision as to who rules over us. Are we seeking the word of the Lord or are we choosing to worship the idols that we have chosen. This is the challenge that is before us today. This is the challenge that we need to decide in order for us to be prepared for the soon outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Any comments? Any questions? All right. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, there is yet a great work to be done in my life and within my character. I thank you, Father, for those that have attended this meeting. I thank you for the time that has been spent I thank you for the words of warning that you have given that is showing the defects in my character. Direct us each on the Sabbath. Help us now, guide us. Help us indeed to walk humbly before you and humbly between, before those that are of your people, of your children, so that your character may be revealed in everything that we say and everything that we do. To this end, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm.